Okay, so in this chapter, we are continuing on the same theme that we were discussing the last four chapters, chapter 41, 42, 43, and 44, but in a different avenue, a different path. What does that mean? You know, in the beginning of Tanya, the first sections of Tanya, the Alter Rebbe explained the tremendous benefit of doing a mitzvah, regardless whether you feel it or not. Why you're doing the mitzvah, what motivates you, the action is all, all that matters. Later on in chapters 39 um, and 40 and 41, etc., and straight to here, he explained that each mitzvah could be lifted and raised to a much higher place when the mitzvah is done for the right reason, which means when we do a mitzvah, there is two possible motivations that are not so great. One is for our ego. It makes us feel good. It makes us feel important, whether in our own mind, whether because people see us, this guy goes to shul every day. Wow, he could be put on tefillin. He gives classes. People could do things that's ego motivated. And that's better do it for ego motivated, not do it at all. But you can't compare it to doing it for the altruistic, ultimate reasons. Another reason we do mitzvahs is called by rote. Automatic. We've been doing it like some people have every day their coffee or every day brush their teeth. Don't even think why they do it anymore. They just do it. A mitzvah can be done. I've been doing lighting Shabbos candles for 30 years, 10 years, 5 years. I just do it. Both of these are okay, but not the ultimate. The ultimate is to do it what's called lishma. So in chapters 41, 42, 43, and 44, he explained two paths to get to this of doing the mitzvah for the right reason. One was called love, one was called reverence or awe. Ava and Yira. And we explained in 41 the importance of Yira, the importance of Ava, how they both come together. We explained paths, how to do it, different levels, Ava and Ava, Ava Salem. In this chapter, we're going to tap into a whole different concept of how to come to Shema, something fascinating, and that's called mercy. There's a very big difference between mercy and kindness. A lot of times in our minds, you put it together, but there's a difference. Let's take for a moment these three ideas. Ava, love. Yira, reverence or awe. And Rachamim, mercy. What's these three ideas? It's the same also as Chesed, Gevura, and Teferis. Chesed, Gevura, and Teferis, as we probably know, and if not, it's good to mention again, the three primary um, spheros that we talk about always go in right, left, center, right, left, and center, whether it's Chachma, Bina, Das, whether it's Chesed, Gevura, Teferes, whether it's Netzach, Heid, Yisait. They always go, there's the right, which is always in the level of more attraction, a connection, and bringing closer. There's the left, which is always more pushing away, more distancing, more rejection. And then there's the center, which is not just a mix of the two, but a whole nother uh, reality. A lot of times we simplify it and say that, you know, the third one is a mix of the two. It's not. It's a whole nother reality based on the qualities of each one. So let's take for a moment chesed, gevura, and teferis. Chesed by definition means kindness. It comes from the idea of attraction. I am attracted to someone or something, and therefore the relationship, the result is love. So the, the concept is kindness, chesed. The source, the, the driving factor is attraction. And the result is love. That's ava. That's chesed. That's the first one, top right. Top left is more of rejection. The, the concept, the, so, the behavior that brings it about, the, the characteristic, I reject something, either because I don't like it or because I'm afraid of it. Or because I don't understand it, or it's too big for me, I have a wall between me and that thing. That brings to a concept called yira, fear. Oh, I'm afraid of it, or I'm, a, I'm, I'm in awe of it. I'm in reverence of it. That's a general mida. And by the way, from those two, fall down below it, the two things of netzach and haid, which is resilience and submission. What's the two things in life that, are, you know, if chesed and gevora in the human body is in the chest, then and and hoid and netzach and hoid are the thighs. The thighs are what motivates you to do things in life. The two things that motivate us is resilience, something's in our way and we overcome it, or submission, we submit to the situation. And those are again the two things of Chesed and Gevura, all in their sub. And over the Tanya, we'll probably go later 
and explain these. But going back to chesed, gevur, and teferes, or love, awe, and mercy, chesed means something I feel close to and I'm kind to it. It's logical, it's something normal, it makes sense, and I'm kind to it, I'm close to it. Gevur is something which is bigger than me, or I'm in awe of it, or I'm avoiding it, and that brings a reverence or a disconnect. Those are the two paths you spoke about Hashem. A love recognizing Hashem is our life, recognizing Hashem is our essence, recognizing He's our Father, or in awe of Him, how great He is, in awe of Him, how big He is, in awe of Him, how insignificant we are before Him. We're coming today to discuss the third thing, which is mercy. Mercy is something else. We mentioned a number of times, one of the beautiful words that we have in Judaism, in general, in Yiddishkeit, in Judaism, words mean something. You know, there are certain words that are very cool in Judaism. One of the words that are outstanding is the word for an ear. The word for an ear in the Chumash, the is called an Eisen. The word for a scale, not a scale like you stand on, but a scale in the old days where there's two different sides to balance it out, is called Maznayim. So 3,000 years ago when the Torah was given, we were told that the same word for ear is the same word as balance. Now we know through the last, I don't know, hundreds of years or a thousand years, we know the equilibrium is in your ears, and that's how you have balance. But the Torah always uses the same word. We find it throughout of all of Yiddishkeit. Words are essentially a root word, which has a connection to all the words that are associated with that. The word yeshiva, which means a study hall, has the same word as sit, same word as cheer, same word as... It's all, all these words come together. The word for mercy in Hebrew is rachamim. Rachamim means mercy. The another word, we might have mentioned this a while back, for the same, the same uh, word means something else, is recha means the womb, the womb of a woman, where a baby is carried. What's the connection between mercy and a womb? It's not because it's a mercy on the lady who's going through a difficult time, or, or she has mercy on the baby. The definition of a recha is that a person says, I am making space within me for another, which means my identity really doesn't allow another here. I am clearing a part of my body aside, and I am making room for someone else in my existence. That's a definition of a room. I am making room for you within me. Mercy means I have my opinion of you. My opinion of you not logically doesn't allow me to help you, to assist you, to be part of you, to understand you, to relate to you. But I have mercy. I am willing to put myself aside and make room for you in my life. That's mercy. Mercy means not that I logically think I should help you because. I owe you money, or you worked for me, or you did something good for me. It's arousing and feeling someone else's pain. Feeling, meaning I'm not feeling myself, I'm feeling them. Think about, God forbid, you see an animal suffering in the street. You see an animal or a person, even worse, God forbid, suffering. There's two levels of mercy you can have. The lower level of mercy, the higher level of mercy. Lower level of mercy is, I feel so uncomfortable seeing this happening. It hurts me to see it. It's not about that person. It's about me. It hurts me to see this animal in pain. So it's mercy. But then there's a time when it's not even you. It's someone you don't even like. Someone you don't even care for. And you see, it's somebody who doesn't have no connection to you. It's not a fuzzy little animal. It's something else. And you have mercy for it, even though you don't logically explain it. But I feel that person right now. I don't feel um, one of the great examples the Rebbe once gave to a woman who, um, a very beautiful story with Rabbi Kaplan, where a woman wrote, to the, wrote a letter to the Rebbe explaining her complexity and pain and difficulty in life. And the Rebbe responded to her that I feel your pain. So she was furious. She wrote back to the Rebbe, what do you mean you feel my pain? How could you feel my pain? You don't know me. What do you mean? The Rebbe wrote back to her a letter, which Rabbi Kaplan was told to give over to her in person. He wrote it in Hebrew. She should translate it. He explained it to her. The Rebbe said to her, you'll see that one day in the near future, Hashem is going to bless you. You're going to get married. And then you're going to be blessed with a child. In the first year of the child's life, the child begins teething. And the teething process hurts the baby tremendously. He can't sleep at night, and the baby is crying a lot. What you should know, the Rebbe says, it hurts the mother even more. When a mother watches the baby crying in pain from the teething, it actually is more painful to the mother. And the Rebbe said, Kach ani that's how I feel your pain. I feel your pain like a mother feels a child's pain, even more than you feel it. That was the Rebbe's response. But the idea, what's the idea of mercy? It means it's not about me. It's not about my understandings, how are my feelings? How does it make you feel? It's the ultimate empathy. You know the old joke, they ask the guy, what's the difference between empathy and apathy? He said, I'll tell you the truth, I don't know and I don't care. 
Meaning empathy means that I feel you, I understand you, and now I'm having trouble enjoying my supper because you're in pain. That's the mercy, that's rachamim. Rachamim means understanding someone else's perspective, not how it makes me feel. How does it make you feel? That's rachamim. Not about me, it's about you. Racham, I'm moving myself aside. And this is going to be the method that we use. Until now, we said that to reach a love of Hashem and a feeling to Hashem and a relationship with God requires a meditation and transformation of self. Today, you're going to see it doesn't require transformation of self. You could be imperfect. I could be imperfect. But if I tap into a certain meditation, I could relate and feel someone else. I don't have to fully know you to feel your pain. I just have to have the ability to feel your pain and understand what you're going through. Someone who reads the story of someone in the Holocaust, unfortunately, is very easy, if you're an intelligent person and no issues, to feel their pain, to feel some of their, uh, to be moved by their experience. Other people will take some more relationship, more understanding. But the bottom line is, if I'm able to feel your pain, I immediately have a relationship with you. And we'll see in a moment, when someone does a mitzvah out of mercy, that is an automatic, like it's a free pass, it's like, a, it's like an express train to doing it for the right reason, not for ego. Remember the three, the two other possibilities are doing it for ego. The mitzvah makes me feel good, feel important, feel you know, like I feel better about myself. I did some mitzvah or I, I did it because I just do it every day. I don't know. I just put on film every day. I just dive in every day. I don't know. I go to shul every week. Or is there something bigger than I'm doing it for a purpose, for something bigger than myself? And that's going to be what we introduce in this chapter here. Chaim. Chapter 45, bottom of page, Samach Dalet. So it's the bottom of the page after 126. Here we are. Perek Oid Yesh There's another straight path. And by the way, it's interesting. The Alter Rebbe uses the word here, Yashar. Yashar is the right word to use because it means straight, direct. But Yashar is the first three letters of the name of two great people that are actually the people that are being discussed here. One is Yaakov, if you know, we're going to see in a moment, we're going to talk about Yaakov. He is also called Yisrael, which starts off with the words Yid, Shin, Reish, Yisrael, Yashar. And also with the teaching of the Baal Shem, this is based on whose also his name was Yisrael. So the Altar could have used another word. It's an easy way, a direct way. Yes. He used the word Yashar because it's particularly accurate to use this word. He said there's a very easy, a very straight path, not this long life-changing life meditations and trying to transform ourselves to fully appreciate God as a creator. We're going to tap into your mercy. Mercy requires less of you figuring it out and more of feeling someone else. How does that relate to mitzvahs? Phenomenal. Uh, to make sure we're doing the mitzvah, not because of ego and not because of rote, because of Every year, the same thing mechanically, but to do it for the sake of God, for the sake of the mitzvah, not for me. By tapping into the attribute of Yaakov. We know we've said this many, many times. The Avais, the forefathers, and the matriarchs, for that matter, correspond to different uh, spheros. The spheros, as we know, is the process that Hashem used to create the world. He used the spheros, many different layers and levels of expression, and those are also found within the soul of every single Jew. We said in the beginning of Tanya, in Perak Gimel and Dal, we explained the DNA of a soul and the, uh, the makeup of a soul. We explained that every soul has 10 characteristics, the powers of the soul called Chachma, Bina, Das, etc. That's one of the explanations that it says that Hashem made man in his image. Let us make man our image, meaning just like God expresses himself with 10 powers of the soul, same thing man has 10 powers of, of meaning the 10 spheres of creation, same thing, man has ten powers of a soul. So, in the forefathers, also the different the different um, leaders of the Jewish people, the different what's called the shepherds of the Jewish people, the each one of them has a sphere that's their sphere. Avraham is called Chesed. He was known for going out and uh, having guests and being kind and being compassionate and saving loads from always giving of himself, always con- oh, the love of to the to the highest degree. Yitzchak was more of self-sacrifice, digging digging wells, the idea of the gvur, the engagement in trying to change the world around you, meaning the gvur, the strictness, that was Yitzchak. Yaakov was called to Ferris, mercy, uh, which is called a straight path, the direct path. Um, it's a very interesting thing that when the Mishkan was built in the desert, they had what's called the temporary tabernacle, the, the, 
Mishkan. And the word beam is these very huge, heavy, 15 foot, couple feet wide, these giant beams that went around to make three of the four walls around the Mishkan. The way they were held together was a various devices that Hashem instructed. In addition to the tops and the bottoms that had like little caps that connected each section of wall, each beam to the one next to it, each of the walls had two interesting things. One was on the outside, it had like a gold um, ring uh, uh, screwed on or welded on uh, to the wall where each wall, if you put a beam through all the rings on each side, it would connect them through um, these rings. That Each one had a ring uh, towards the top and towards the bottom. And a stick went through each of the walls through these rings and connected them. They shouldn't wobble with each other. It connected them. And there was two for the right wall, two for the back wall, and two for the third wall. So one on top, one on bottom, a total of six sticks all together for these three walls. In addition, there was one more thing called the Bria HaTichin. The stick or the, sta- the pole that went through all the way from one side to the other. And a miracle happened. Because when they made the walls, they also drilled. They had a hole that went through each beam. And it was lined up. And the beams, the holes, lined up all the way around all three sides. And they took the solid beam and they stuck it in from one side. And a miracle happened that when it came time to turn around the corners, it turned, it bent. And then it was still remained hard to hold the walls together. That was called the Bria HaTichayin, which is called the third one. There's a top, the bottom, Chesed Gevura. And then Teferis, the one that goes all the way through. Like the, the Midah of Tefer, it's also called the Midah of MS Truth. As you know, the word truth has three letters, Aleph, Mem, Tuf. It's the first letter, the middle letter, and the last letter of the Aleph base is the uh, word MS. Because MS, also the numerical value, if you add up the digits, equals nine. Nine always multiply by itself. If you add up digits, equals nine again. There's, there's something about the MS that's true, it's consistent. True has to be always true. It can't be true yesterday, not true today. If it's true, it's always true. It can't be, you know, you know I'm, I, I only lie once a week. Then, you, then you're not a truthful person. A truthful person is only, you know, someone, someone who always says the truth. Everyone could go most of the day without lying. The trick is that one time that you got to say something that you shouldn't, that's the, different, the difference. So a consistent, authentic truth is the ultimate in truth, and that's the Ferris, Rachamim. It's the truthful midah. It's the one that lasts and carries through in all situations. That's Yaakov. Yaakov is the attribute of Rachamim, mercy, truth, etc. So what does this mean here in relationship to God, Torah, mitzvahs, etc.? He says something which is, I heard, I, I read a talk of the Rebbe on this subject from 1953, which was very moving, and I'll maybe mention some of it as we go through this. He says, Hashem, <laughs> To arouse within yourself a tremendous, tremendous mercy, al nitzus halikus, on the soul, the spark that gives life to your soul. Just to identify ourselves for a moment, we are a person of flesh and blood that has a soul which is our core that gives us life. And we mentioned the soul has many dimensions to it. It's the godly soul and there's the animal soul. The animal soul has dimensions of the natural soul, the vital soul, and the animal soul. That's the natural soul is what gives us all our nature to care for ourselves and not, not to let ourselves get burned by fire and to avoid falling off high things, etc. Take care of ourselves. And that's also what keeps our, our five senses functioning, the natural soul. And that's how can we see and we can hear and we can touch and uh, feel. These are all spiritual tendencies. The fact your eyes can see is not a physical thing as much as interaction of physical and spiritual as is taste and flavor, etc. And the same thing, you have the vital soul that gives you life, it keeps your blood pumping. It keeps the electrical pulse in your heart going, and it keeps the blood pumping in your body and your blood warm. This is all through the soul that gives life. That is the core of our existence, the soul. And of course, the godly soul, which gives us something of uh, altruistic, bigger than ourselves, selflessness, etc. But all of that is powered by the core of the soul. What's the core of the soul? Nitzot alikus, nitzot alika, a spark. There's a small actual part of God, an actual speck of God that's in each of our identities. And that's what gives our soul the power to be a soul. You see, our soul is our identity, how we feel, what we remember, what we know. Everything, our identity is not our hands or our foot or our chin or our forehead or even our brain. Our identity is the spirit, the soul that's within that. So our, our identity is our soul, the composite of the animal, the godly soul with all its levels. 
But the identity of a soul starts with its core, which is a spark of God. That means within every single Jew, it's with every single human being in general, but within every single Jew in particular, there's a spark of actual God inside of him. Now, we have to have mercy on this spark of God. Why? The spark of God, before we were born, going back for most of us 37 years, before we were born, going back to pre-birth, the soul was in a beautiful place, in a palace of spirituality, and only good, and only life, and only positive. And the soul was thrust against its will into a world of deception, dishonesty, pain, suffering, anxiety, different uh, misrepresentations, uh, people in selfish indulgences, all sorts of behaviors and, and lifestyles that are the antithesis of holiness and the antithesis of good and what a soul enjoys. That means the soul, it's like taking the child of a king who is used to living in luxury and dumping him into a third world country where he's abused by the natives. And everything that goes on around him is hurtful and, in spite, and spiteful and uncomfortable. This is the soul. The soul came from a perfectly pure place. And it comes into a body to experience the most difficult of journeys. And the Rebbe, in this talk of 1953 on his wedding anniversary, he goes into great length describing the journey of the soul to come down here. How it passes the different layers of the Garden of Eden, the higher level, the lower level, and coming down into a world of dishonesty. And all of this is talking when it comes into the soul of a good, holy person. Because the good, holy person is also living in the physical world. You see, of all the worlds, the, the world of Asiya we live in is the most coarse and corrupt. It's the world where no light of godliness is seen obviously. In truth, everything is godliness, but no obvious sign of it. In the higher worlds, while there's angels and there's souls, you feel others, you feel those who are not God himself, but others, they all recognize in truth it's all about God. In this world, you could think it's about the dollar bill, you think it's about feeling good, a good meal, a comfortable house, a nice boat, a nice car, a perfectly fit body. All the, all the attractions and, and, and focuses are not about God naturally. If a person works on themselves, they can get past themselves, they can get godly. But naturally, this physical world is a world of tremendous indulgence and ungodly, and not God. And as a matter of fact, God gets in the way of my existence for the average person who doesn't work on getting past that. So the soul comes into this world, and it's an unbelievable, unbelievable journey of pain. And the Rebbe points out in that talk of 1953, he says two things we know. He says, first, first he makes a comment. He says, so why does the soul come down to this world? He says, the soul comes down to this world because it's called Yurida Tzarech Aliyah. The accomplishments that it can get from this experience is worth it. Like someone who doesn't like to exercise and goes and joins a gym, especially if they're very out of shape. So exercise really is not fun. When you're in shape, exercise can be fun or enjoyable. When you're out of shape, it's not fun at all. And you go, why? Because you know it's worth it. Or when someone talks, takes a job, it's not easier. The hours aren't good, but you need the money. Or when someone goes through a process of investment of a difficult experience, a surgery or something else, to, to get to a better place. In other words, we're, we all know about investing and going through an uncomfortable process to get something better. The Rebbe points out two things we know for sure. One thing we know for sure, that it's worth it. God, who saw the big picture and sees the big picture, if he chooses a soul to come down to this world, as difficult as it's going to be, we know one thing, it's worth it. Because otherwise God wouldn't send, send the soul down here. And the second thing we know is, and this is fascinating, there's no other way to achieve this. If there was a way to achieve this uh, enhancement of the experience of a soul without going through the suffering of this world, Hashem would have found that way. Which fits, by the way, into a very interesting statement the Rebbe once made out of Fabringen. The Rebbe once said that since I was a child walking to Cheder, which you got to assume is four or five years old, and even earlier, so you can imagine what that means, the Rebbe says, I used to think to myself how incredible the coming of Mashiach must be that Hashem made a calculation that all of exile is worth it. Which means, imagine this. Imagine you tell a person, I'm going to give you $100 million. How much would you agree to suffer for that? Hashem made a calculation that it was worth the Spanish Inquisition, it was worth the pogroms of the Cossacks, the Crusaders, the suffering of uh, Chimelnetsky's uh, um, terrible pogrom in Poland, the suffering of all the Jews in exile, the Holocaust, and all the suffering. It's worth it to the ultimate goal of Mashiach. I used to think to myself as a child, how, how, how wonderful must Mashiach be that Hashem made a calculation that's worth it. 
Our minds can't grasp it. We can't accept anything worth one child being abused, God forbid, or killed. We can't accept one. There was nothing, no humanly sane, no sane person will ever say, you know, I'll give you a hundred million dollars if you let me do this to the child. Are you kidding me? Are you crazy? It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's no, there's no money that can pay for that. If you're caring, God's caring. And Hashem said it's worth 2,000 years of what he went through for Mashiach. They said it must be something incredible. Because Hashem makes a calculation. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's amazing. So that's his idea. So the Rebbe says that all of this must be, meaning the soul comes down for a, for a purpose, and that's why we're suffering. In that particular sikha, just one more point from that sikha, that talk, the Rebbe says, imagine if a soul comes down to this world and doesn't do its job and doesn't come up to heaven with a better in a better place because he slacked off in this world. Imagine the pain of suffering for no reason. And the Rebbe goes through a lengthy explanation that in life, and similar to what we know as logotherapy or um, Victor Frankl's book on man's search for meaning, where he says, and by the way, he had a connection with the Rebbe. The Rebbe corresponded with him. He, the Rebbe says that suffering with a purpose, with a meaning, is terrible. Suffering with no purpose, for no reason, is the worst. So when a soul comes down to this world and goes through the difficult life, and doesn't do the mitzvahs that you have to be a cold-hearted person to mistreat and abuse the soul that way. Okay, that's the talk from there. One more point on this subject. The Alter Rebbe has many maimarim and the Kodah Torah and Torah Er, which is his collected essays that he wrote in the late 1700s and the early 1800s. And these essays, and I noticed this myself, even though I saw this in someone else, but I'm going to tell you now is not my thing. I saw it somewhere else. But I noticed this over the years of when I did learn the Alter Rebbe's maimarim. He has many maimarim on the theme called Lama Yarda Neshama Lamata. Why did God send the soul down here? And he answers, because you read the Tzarek Haliyah to go to a higher place. And the question that was asked is, why does he have so many maimarim on the same subject? He, once you, you covered you covered the subject. Imagine I write an essay 10 times on the same subject. He has hundreds of maimarim explaining the same subject all different ways. And the answer is, when something's in an emotional pain, you can't help but keep addressing it. You see, if someone goes to work, you don't have to say, why do I have to go to work every day? I, I know I go to work because it's my job. But if someone has someone in the family, a close person that hurts them and, and bothers them and harasses them, or someone has something unfair, unright, you can't stop talking about it. Why? Because as much as you're trying to explain to me all the reasons why it's okay, at the end of the day, it's not okay. It's suffering. I mean, at the end of the day, the soul is suffering. As much as someone's going to say why and understand why certain things happen in life that's painful, it's never really going to satisfy the question because you can't satisfy emotion with intellect. As much as I can intellectually understand, God forbid, why uncle this had to have his leg amputated, he will always have that in his mind every single day, this question. You know, why? Why does that have to happen? Why? Because when something's an emotional change, it doesn't help to answer the question. It's something which is always there on your shoulders. This idea of the soul's journey to this world, every day the Shama is here, it's uncomfortable. But we can't even imagine it until someone goes through, God forbid, an experience in the most uncomfortable place of strangers where you don't belong and you don't fit in and you're not appreciated, not respected, not even noticed of any of your qualities. As a matter of fact, you're seen as a burden and a bother when you are, in fact, just the opposite. That's how the soul experiences life every single day. It's the annoying conscious or the annoying existence that's being either ignored or, or messed around with. It's like, uh, imagine if someone is allergic very severely to peanuts and the people all around them are eating peanuts all day long, giving them all sorts of allergy, allergic reactions. The soul is allergic to certain behaviors of non-kosher food and certain things. And when a person goes and does these things, it's an abuse to the soul that's unfair. Says the Alter Rebbe, you want to come to do a mitzvah for the right reason. You don't have to figure out meditations of God as my father. You don't have to figure out meditations of God as my life. You don't have to figure out meditations of cha changing yourself and becoming spiritual. Just think for a few minutes, a little Rachmanis on the soul. Have some Rachmanis. Do a mitzvah today. Do it for the soul. He's going through such a difficult time. Think about that. He says, don't change yourself. I mean, you should. But he's saying, you don't have to change yourself. Just take a few moments to appreciate this godly spark within you that every single day is around things it's allergic to. And we're talking here about, remember, a holy person has never sinned. The next thing is going to be, imagine if you yourself are doing sins. We're talking here about a holy person. 
Rabbi Holy Goldberg, who comes to shul every day, and he davens and does mitzvahs, but he's living in a world of sin, a world of selfish pursuits, a world where the dollar matters much more than the you know, than the kayas that someone could do. And this soul is living in this world of so much unfair and pure and unholiness. Imagine in a moment if you yourself are one of those people causing the uncomfortability for the soul. He says, so you, if you have to arrange, erase, erase up this idea of Yaakov, Yaakov is mercy, not chesed, not love, not gevura, but another path, not awe, but mercy. Have a little rachmanis on your neshama. Ha-mechaya nafshoi asher yorad b'mkere chaya chaya main zayi baruchu that he came down from this highest and loftiest place, the source of life, may be blessed. The Alter Rebbe here uses the famous three expressions. We've had this many times in Tanya, we'll go through it very quickly. Very often, the Alter Rebbe uses these three expressions, Memale, Seviv, and Klechashiv. Real briefly, it comes first the level of God, uh, which is Memale, which fills the word, which means the level of God, which godliness and power and light and, and sustenance that is commensurate to the world. It matches, it gives a different amount of life to a beetle and to a, uh, a, a human being and to an angel and to a planet. Everything gets its level of light. That's a Mali. Even higher is Saiviv, where the level of God that comes into the world is like a general life force that doesn't differentiate between a, um, a beetle and a, a person and a planet, an angel. It's just one life force that's equal. It's like if Einstein could do a class two ways. He can come into a school and go into each classroom and modify and give a class to each individual level of stu- study, from college students to third graders. Obviously, the third graders are getting much less information. They just is limiting 99% of his knowledge and just telling them about some theory of relativity, or whatever he wants to explain to them. And then you can have him how he speaks to a college class. That's called Omali. He modifies himself for each recipient. Then you have Seba, even a higher level of God is, where it's Einstein giving a Zoom lecture where he can't see his recipients. He doesn't know who he's talking to. And he's talking. Some people get some of it, some get none of it. He just, he's just talking. It's just him expressing itself. Then there's a level of God, which can't even use the metaphor of Einstein anymore, where the whole world doesn't seem to exist. Of course it exists. The Alder is always careful to use the word kiloi. It's like it's not there. Of course it's there. But it's like it's not there, meaning it's so insignificant. It's like Hashem created the world with one breath. Imagine somebody wrote a biography of you or myself of covering 60 years, 70 years, 80 years of my involvement in communal work. And I spent time talking about that one morning. I went like this. I breathed. To God, the whole creation is one breath. That's not who he is. As you mentioned many times, it wouldn't make it to his resume. It's the whole creation of the world. So in other words, Hashem's, to, the, to Hashem, who is so great, the world doesn't think of any existence at all. And that's where the soul comes from. Not just Memali, not just Saviv. But the level of clay chashim, where the world doesn't seem to have any significance or importance at all, zero, is as much of significance as you give to one grain of grass in Ethiopia that you haven't seen yet. Uh, what is that one grain of grass? That one, sorry, one grain of sand. That one grain of sand is more significant to me in my life than the whole creation of the world. Because the whole creation of the world is a bunch of zeros to God. And a billion, a trillion zeros still remain zero. Whereas creation, which to me, a grain of sand, is one part of our entire planet. And if you add up enough of those parts, you get the entire planet. But in other words, the world is so insignificant compared to God. That level of God, then is a high level, is where the soul comes from. Not just from Mali, not just Savior, but from Klei Chash, the highest level. And that soul comes where, he says, um, he, he, he gets put into the skin of a serpent. Mishcha means the skin, Chivya means of a serpent. We're talking about the primordial serpent. We're talking about the serpent of the story of Adam and Eve, Adam and Chava, that it's put into that world where deception is primary. There's so much in the world that is deception. People, how they either compliment each other, people, how they present themselves or talk about or what their missions are. And especially when you get to the world of politics, the world of communal stuff, there's so much disingenuous expression. And it goes through people's reasons why they act, do acts of kindness. People give fun, uh, funds to certain organizations because they need to get, uh, you, know, you know, they want this party to vote for them and this person to legislate laws for them. There's so much, of, obviously, it's not negating all the good. There's tremendous, tremendous good. But we're pointing out naturally without effort. All the good happens because someone went against the trend, went against natural. Natural nature is one thing. I care for myself, survival of me. 
I want to take care of the world cir circles around me. I have to survive. I need to be taken care of. But they call it take care of number one. That going against the trend, that's already spirituality. But naturally, the, the soul comes into what's called Mishka the Chibi, the skin of the snake, into the world of deception. Which is distant from Hashem, but Talas is from the furthest level of distance. That means he came, it's like sometimes you know, you send your kid away uh, to a camp or to a program, to a boarding school, or your kid moves to another city because he got married, he has a job. And you're, you're so important to you that the place he's in is treating him properly. Because the food that he's getting in camp and the way the teachers talk to him and the friends. Hashem sent himself, he sent the part of himself down to this world. And what's the place that you sent your family member to is a place where he's not liked and not respected, not appreciated. The, the agitation and the anxiety in the parent is tremendous. And this is what happened to the soul. The soul went to a place of perfection, of pure good, where it doesn't exist anything which we see in our world as sadness, pain, suffering, you know, hurt, etc. And it comes into the world where the primary thing is where injustice thrives. Things that are not true are presented as truth. Things that are unholy as proclaimed in parades. This is the holy way to go, etc. The entire trend of life is the antithesis of the comfortable life of a soul where he was before he came down here. Because <laughs> this world is the ultimate of concealment of everything holy is concealed and everything good is not seen. And what's seen is the naturally is all selfish stuff. Um, it was a Rebbe. I don't know if it was the Ruziner or the Baditcher. I think it was the Baditcher. Yeah. The Baditcher once said, he said, God, you pulled a nice trick on the, on the Jewish people and on the world. You put all of good spirituality in a book and you put all material excitements and pleasures in front of us. I guarantee you, if you would have put all the pleasures of the world in a book and put godliness in front of us, you would have chosen all of us to be godly. Meaning, we don't see it naturally. I could tell you in a second, without any going, going to any classes, why potato chips taste good. Or that why I can tell you I like potato chips. I can tell you I like a well done steak. I like it to feel good. I like when people say nice things to me. I like all the things that make me feel good and even better. On the other hand, the things that are spiritual, I don't always like them. Maybe I, I know what I like them when it makes me feel good. If I do mitzvahs and I feel more, more complete, more whole, that's naturally why I would do a mitzvah. Why I would help out a poor man because it makes me feel better about myself. I mean, I might say it makes me feel better in general. It hurts me to see a guy suffering. Again, it hurts me. In other words, the natural tendency, even for good, is all about self. The whole world's to go and do it for other, for God. When I, when I don't understand, and I don't agree, and I don't want, and I'm not in the mood, that's Yiddishkeit. That is Yiddishkeit, but that is not easy. And that's what the soul is living in, where he is the unnatural, the unwanted, the unpleasant. And again, when is it most holy is only when you don't want to do it. Yiddishkeit that you want to do, as beautiful as it is, and as special as it is, is not the ultimate. The ultimate is when you don't agree. Like we hear the metaphor many times, if your parent or a teacher or a rabbi tells you to do something, and it makes sense to you, and you do it. What if he tells you something that doesn't make any sense at all? He tells you, I want you to do X, Y, or Z, and to you, not only it makes sense, it's ridiculous. So if you don't do it, Nothing wrong with you, but it shows you that in truth you never were doing it because the rabbi asked you or your parents asked you. You're doing it because it made sense to you. But if you go and do it when it doesn't make sense to you and you don't agree with it and you're against it philosophically or ethically, that means, you know what? It's about you. When I do something, it's really for you. The, the ultimate litmus test when you do something for someone else is if you don't agree with it. Because as long as you agree, you're really doing it for yourself. That's a certain extent. A mitzvah that doesn't make sense to us in our mind. That's why Hashem broke down the mitzvahs into three parts. Some that don't make sense, and some that do make sense, etc. Because he wants us to have the aspect of doing mitzvahs when they don't make sense to us. Meaning, what's the benefit? Because then I'm not doing it for myself. On the other hand, Hashem wants many mitzvahs to make sense to us. Because why? We have to have feeling, understanding. A mitzvah that we're doing blindly without any feeling is a sad mitzvah. It's yeah, beautiful in, in connection to God, but it's sad. No feeling, no excitement, no interest. Imagine you drive your parents to the airport. I don't want to do it. It's not interesting to me. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. <laughs> Where's the excitement and the enjoyment? So you have to have all different parts. Even though I don't want to do it, I do it. At the same time, I enjoy it. So it's all these balances. But it's a very challenging, and it takes a lot of personal effort and personal growth and personal transformation to get to these points. And this is why the soul suffers. But now he says, imagine when you do a mitzvah. Imagine that the light is like a person who's parched and thirsty 
and need a drink, and you go now and light a Shabbos candle. You go now and give a penny in the tzedakah box. You go now and say the moda'ani. You say you go now and wash the box in the morning. You walk into shul and, and uh, say hello to someone who looks down. You sit next to them. When you were to sit here, you sit somewhere else and make them smile. These are things that are like breath of fresh air. It's like cool water on the parched lips of the soul. The soul is so yearning for it. It's like a starving soul that you're giving some life-saving nutrients. This is what he's saying here. You want to do a mitzvah. <clears throat> if you're doing it for ego, good. You're doing it for either mechanical, road for every day, good. You know what the ultimate is? Do it because you feel bad for the soul. Imagine you say, you know what? Listening to this chapter of Tanya, learning it. Today I'm going to go on bench just to give my soul some juicy satisfaction. An ice cold Snapple tea, you know, peach flavored tea for the soul. A nice hot cup of tea, a nice meal. I am going to have some mercy on this starving Achmanis case. That's not Achmanis on God. That's Achmanis on God's expression in this world.